Hey, it's James from Marketing for Restaurants, and welcome to episode 39 of Secret Source, the Restaurant Marketing Podcast, The Secrets of Restaurant Profitability. Some restaurants are quiet, lose money, and the owner works 70 hours a week. Other restaurants are busy, profitable, and the owners work a few hours a day. What's the difference? They have a secret sauce. Join James from Marketing for Restaurants as he helps you come up with your recipe for restaurant success, your secret sauce. Welcome back, everyone. Today, we've got a really, really interesting discussion. Ivan Brewer from Restaurantology. Now, Ivan has run a lot of successful restaurants in his time. He's also done some master's level studies in some of the more esoteric areas around the financial operations of a restaurant. And I think he's got some really, really key points to bring out. And I think you're going to get a lot lot out of the discussion that we have with him. Before we talk about that, though, I want to talk about something that happened today that was kind of funny in the marketing for restaurants office. So we were talking about, we have a a meeting every day where the the whole team gets together and we we discuss what each person's doing and the issues and opportunities that each person's got around, you know, building out the product and marketing things that we're doing. And we were talking about a customer who was using Forbes, our free online restaurant booking system. And we need to update our figures. It's done in excess of $17 million worth of bookings and and it's growing, you know, 10% a month. Awesome product super excited about it. Now, one of the things that we talk about is, you know, we kind of review our onboarding process and we we were discussing one of our new customers. And now I thought, you know, so website, online booking system. And I thought, oh, yep. And then I thought, well, hang on a sec. I haven't seen their name anywhere. And now that's not unusual because we've got lots and lots and lots of customers. But, uh, you know, I I just like to see how, how new restaurants are going. And so we've got a big monitor of information for the company and I walked up and it was like, well, they're not there. And I thought, oh, that's a bit interesting. Now, that doesn't cover all of the people. Then I started going through the email reports that I get. I get email reports every day about, you know, how customers are going. And it's like, uh, I'm not seeing this. So where are they? And so I'm starting to worry now. There's a customer who's come to us. They obviously want to get find more customers and get repeat customers. And I'm thinking they're not appearing in any of my data. So it doesn't look like we're doing a very good job for them. And then they, the team said, oh, you know, so this is the customer and they're in Perth. And I've gone, okay, good. And I just Google their name and I click on the first link. Uh, a little bit sad because it's a, it's one of those menu log dodgy website. So Menulog have created a website very similar to their name to try and capture traffic from people who are looking to deal directly with the restaurant. Menulog sort of create these sort of fake websites in front of them and then run ads to them and all sorts of things to make it appear that that customers are dealing directly with the restaurant. And of course, Menulog being Menulog, they're probably charging them 13%. And the most insidious part is they're not giving them the customer's details you know so the the restaurant doesn't get the email address which means they can't remarket to them so it's quite nasty and it's like so where's their website and then you know one of the marketers i'll send you the url and it's like no don't send me the damn url i want to find it in google like this is what we do we help people be found online why is it that I cannot find them? And I'm going through the first page and, you know, and then I'm then on the second page. And you know the old joke about the second page? Where would you hide a body on the second page of Google? Because no one ever looks there. And I'm thinking, what is going on here? We spend all of this time and effort in providing our customers with websites that drive truckloads of traffic to their restaurant. What's going on? And then I said, so why can't they be found? And they said, oh, yeah, the website's awful. It's like, well, why is their website awful? We don't build awful websites. No, they're not a website customer. It's like, oh, oh, okay. They sent me through the URL. The website looks hideous. There's absolutely no SEO that's been done in there. Turns out it's been made by Quandu. Now, the thing that's super hilarious is that the reservations page has actually got our reservation system on it. Now, the big, and I don't know these guys at all, Thai Restaurant Perth, that's all I know about them. I don't know if they're any good or not. I don't know how many customers they do every week. We've got very little insight into that. What we do know, though, is that their website is getting 
zero traffic for them. And I think this has got to be killing them. Compare and contrast. So we've got a restaurant in Sydney, an Indian restaurant. The online reviews are pretty good for them. Now, they're taking around $2,000 a week in online orders. That's, so that's going to equate out to about $100,000 a year. More importantly, they're using the free online restaurant ordering system, which means that they're not paying any commission and they're collecting orders. So the kind of thing that you can be doing if you're doing online, uh, if you're doing takeout, they're doing 44 orders last week, I think, and they're saving. So all up, they're on track to save $13,000 a year. Now, best practice, we recommend you dump five and a half, uh, six and a half of that. So 50% of your savings should go into a marketing campaign. That's over a hundred dollars a week. You may not even need to spend that much. Have a listen to the podcast on what should your budget be. They may not need, even need to spend that much. Really interesting because people are finding them. They get quite a bit of traffic to their website. The website looks quite new and up to date. It's got some great pictures in it. They're one of our website customers as well. So getting thousands of visits every month, that's equating to $100,000 worth of revenue which you know I think is really powerful. And you put them side to side with someone who's using Menulog, they're going to be $13,000 better off, which is probably going to be a supported marketing campaign. So effectively something that's being paid for out of the saved commission. And I would have thought, you know, that restaurant owner is probably going to end up pocketing an extra eight grand, which, you know, from my point of view, that's super exciting. And their, their orders keep going up because they haven't started running that marketing campaign. We're in discussions with them at the moment on, on how they can run their own marketing campaign. I think that that's the future. So yes, it was funny because I thought that they were one of our website customers. It really does highlight the fact that if you've got a website that's not working for you, so these guys, they have, they have got our reservation system and they haven't taken a reservation in three weeks. Seriously, people, that's got to be ringing some bells. Very, very scary. Remember, your website should be doing your sales and marketing for you. The Indian restaurant in Sydney, every day they're getting money coming in from their website. The Thai restaurant in Perth, every day they're losing out because people are looking for Thai food in Perth and they're going to their competitors. That's really sad. So on to today. So Ivan Brewer, a really smart guy, and he talks about some things that I have not heard anyone else talk about really quite a strong understanding of the way that you can create that recipe for restaurant profitability. So let's get into it and have a listen to what Ivan's got to say about how you can increase the profitability in your restaurant. Hey, Ivan, welcome to the podcast. Hi, James. Fantastic to talk to you today. Yes. So do you want to give everyone just a little bit of an idea about what it is that you do? And your background. Yeah, absolutely. So I'm, what I'm all about is restaurants. It's, it's my life. I guess like a lot of people in the hospitality industry, I sort of stumbled and fell into it. And when I sort of picked myself up again, just realized it's something that I love. I've been very, very lucky. I've worked with just a lot of people that have been very generous in sharing their knowledge, you know, great mentors and just really world-class operators. And I've, I've sort of started to, to take that base. I've, I've worked in pretty much every type of operation that I can over the last 20 years from super high end to high volume to quick service style and then you know, run pubs, the, the whole thing. And I guess for me, what really kicked me on to the next level was when I undertook master's level, under, so undertook my MBA and really wanted to, once you become responsible for a P&L, I really wanted to, to know well, what, what can I do? How can I make this business better? And that really took me on a journey of, of questioning everything, basically. I think, um, to me, it's all about asking better questions and asking a why. And it started, for me, I started to uncover some things that just didn't quite make sense in what we were doing as, a, as an industry. And I really wanted to be focused purely on one thing. And that's how it is that we improve profitability in our restaurants and how we improve their survivability and success. And I think that it, it's a the profitability issue worldwide is something that a lot of restaurant owners are struggling with because so many of them are barely profitable or unprofitable for extended periods of time, which is really sad given the the hard work that goes into so many restaurants. 
I, I, I 100% agree. I think having sort of worked shoulder, you know, shoulder to shoulder with people in restaurants, restaurants are an all or nothing kind of scenario, you know, in Australia to, to get a loan to buy a, to buy a hospitality business, it's a 40% equity, which is often someone's house that's up, up. you know, we, we employ enormous amounts of people and those people then go off and spend money in the economy. You know, that every restaurant operation, hospitality operation buys products. They, they are huge consumers themselves. So they, they continually put back into the local economy. So they're very, very important. They really are. And with our modern way of, you know, we're all busy, you know, we love to go out and get a coffee. We like to go out and take our kids to get something to eat. It's, um, it's a huge part. It's a very fabric of, of our society and how it is that we choose to live nowadays. And it's really tough, you know, in Australia, you know, the best figures that we've got around somewhere like 92% of our, you know, SMEs, so our smaller operations, make 2% net profit. And you could keep your money in a bank and make more money than that. It's absolutely crazy. And, you know, 50% of them won't see their fourth birthday. And even though we see a global expansion in terms of total spend, it feels like there's just more and more people eating at the same pie. So the profitability is just getting smaller and smaller. So it's, a, it's absolutely a very, very tough game. It's a full contact. It is a full contact game. So from your point of view, what are the biggest restaurant profitability mistakes that people make when they're when they're running a restaurant? Probably the number one thing that I see is that people you know, people fall in love with food. They fall in love with what it is that they want to do. And that that thing that they want to do doesn't necessarily make sense within the the specific context of their business. So it's all fine to say that we want to produce this type of food or that we, we want to feel proud about and that's what we want to hang our hat on. But if it, if your rent percentage is high, if, if you haven't constructed the overall business model to suit your specific location, and every location is going to be different, you know, within the, the size of the business, the location of the kitchen, it's all a little bit different. So for me, the number one thing is really understanding the impact of your really key um, fixed cost. Your main one in Australia being your rent. So on average, 11.6% of your um, net cost are going to be gone, you know, spent on rent, which is really high. That's a, that's a very, very high percentage. So, And I think it's something that's becoming a global trend. The, the cost, and we saw it in Australia sort of around that 2000 mark with a huge property boom, and then the commercial properties went up. So that cost of those locations and and the physical size of our restaurants. So probably one, the size of the rent we pay. And two, another key problem is that our venues are too big. So we have huge fluctuations within a week. I have a restaurant that I'm working with. 60% of their revenue happens in two days, on a Friday and Saturday night. So then it's a ghost town for the other five days of the week. So do we build a, a venue based on peak trading on a Friday, Saturday, or do we have a bit more consideration towards not being un, so unprofitable on the other five days of the week. Yeah, so rent would be my number one thing that I would have a wee little peek at when I look at a restaurant. So 11.6 of net cost. So that would be, and it, given the fact that profit is so low, that would almost be 11.6% of revenue then? Would that be right? <laughs> yeah, exactly right. Not a lot of difference between the two. It's scary, isn't it? Yeah, it is. It is. So if rent is such an important determinant for profitability, how do you start to think about rent? What are the factors that you want to start thinking about when you're looking at that line item in the P&L? So rent for me, what I would like to see, you know, we've all heard the story from the commercial real estates and when you're looking to buy a business and say, well, yeah, yeah, the rent's quite high, but, you know, it's all about the foot traffic. It's, it's about the location. But if you walk away from that and look at that from a distance a little bit, you say, well, if it is such a good location and it's so good on my foot traffic, wouldn't my percentage be lower because I'm making so many more sales? So it's it's about what is that percentage of your net turnover. So the beauty of hospitality is I kind of describe it like you're baking a cake, right? So there's going to be a cake at the end. Every step of the, every ingredient can be a little bit different. You know, every cook's going to approach a recipe in a slightly different way. So it doesn't matter 100% as to what is the composition of all of those key ingredients and when they're added in, but it does matter what they all add up to. So when you've got a high rent percentage, you need to start thinking about, well, okay, effectively that's come into my profit. So I've just lost 3 or 4% out of my profit because of where my rent sits. So how am I going to claim that back? 
does my business model mean now that I have a, a way in which I operate the business that has some downward pressure on my labour? You know, do I do counter service as opposed to table service? Do I focus on a high table turnover? How do I go about adjusting my business to accommodate that? You know, how do I do that within my cost of goods? And that really informs everything. Once you start asking those questions, you start thinking about, well, what menu do I, I need to develop? What kind of throughput do I need on a Friday, Saturday night? How many kitchen staff do I need? Both at a peak time, but also in a quiet time. So when I'm only doing you know, 40, 50 people in a night, can I do that with one or two staff instead of having a whole brigade? And when I'm on a really peak time, can I just do that with three or four? You know, you start to actually map out a pretty good idea of, of what the business should look like and how it is that we then go about adjusting little elements of it to start to achieve that. Now, obviously, you're going to be more profitable if you're able to achieve the same revenue per hour, let's say, with less staff. How would you then change that number? How, how can you employ less people during a peak period? What are the kind of things that you would start looking at? Some of the, if I sort of go back and look at it through my journey, it's probably the the number one thing that that I've sort of coined and really focused upon is is so much of the, our productivity. So if we think about productivity, is is the output, the result that we get for our inputs, you know, for the number of staff and the number of costs are going to wages, for example. Now, there's a lot of discretionary effort in our staff. You know, we'll all have staff that can, you know, one of them is just going to, you know, be solid but not particularly fast or outstanding and you have another staff member that's just humming away. And the more we can engage our staff, so that staff engagement and there's particular strategies to be able to achieve that, for a lot of operations, it's simply a matter of the profit that you need to get is within the productivity of your staff. You improve that level of discretionary effort, and it's not about burning them and overworking them and having them continually overstaffed. It's about being able to get them highly engaged and to really listen to them because they generally know, you know, well, what do you mean? I need to work, walk three times the distance within a night. I'm wasting all of my time doing these things. How about we do it this way? you engage them in getting to an understanding of how to be more efficient, and there's a number of you know strategies to look at, that's probably one of the absolute keys. But it is down to you know your flow of service, down to your food runners, how does it they're split up in terms of do they have sections, do they have floaters? There's a number of ways in which you can look at that. But the, the number one key thing for me is if you've got a really engaged team, you're going to unlock profit. Yep. That's a whole different topic in itself, isn't it? Because it's um, oh yeah, it is something that I think far too few restaurant owners pay any attention to because of the fact that it, it that is in itself a very difficult thing to do. I completely agree, and there's I, I hear, you hear a lot, you know, hear the whole oh this younger generation, or I'm frustrated, and I've just not really ever found that to be honest. And you you can go to a local Gloria Jeans or a uh, McDonald's or, you know, any of your standard bed franchises, and they're all 15 and 16-year-olds. And they're awesome. <laughs> like you're sitting back going, wow, look, at these guys are really pumping it through and they're fantastic and engaged. And they're there. The thing is, it's us that have to engage them. <laughs> you can't simply, you know, toss that football over to the to your staff and go, off you go, go be engaged. <laughs> all the best. And there are particular things, you know, in de- designing an experience and, I've had a, a lot of success around making a venue, say 100% Australian only wines, for example, or those sorts of things. Get them excited on the journey and get them excited about the products that they're selling, the stories that they're selling, because we, we sell stories. We don't sell products in hospitality. We sell stories. Get them excited about that, then they're just going to get away. But as, as you said, that is a whole beast of its own. <laughs> exactly. What sort of KPIs then should people really be starting to try and and look at what are the key KPIs, if there is such a thing, that you would look at? So the, when I, I want to do a business viability test, so if I want to look at a business, the number one thing I'm going to look at is, first of all, the because this informs the key KPI. So what is the current distribution of your costs? So what are your percentage of fixed costs versus your variable costs? And this is one of the key, key, key areas. I've seen really, you know, highly experienced, large organisations that are making one of these fundamentalist mistakes. So if we look at fixed costs as something that isn't dependent on your revenue, so it's going to more or less be the same. 
you know, pretty much your accounting costs, pretty much, you know, your rent, those sorts of things are going to be consistent. Your variable costs can be things like your gas and your power, the things that will fluctuate relating to buying your napkins, you know, relating to your revenue. And that's really important because we need to then understand what are your cost of goods consistent with your model and what is your, your labour target. Cost of goods should be pretty consistent. It's a concept that will bounce around day by day based on the actual sales mix on any given day. But if you've got your menu under control via your costings, via your wastage, via your inventory management, all those sorts of things and the mistakes of the night, that's something I'd love to see done weekly. And I personally run a venue based on doing a weekly P&L, which means a weekly stock take. So I know exactly where my cost of goods are. But certainly would like to see that monthly. So, but that's a context setter. The other thing then is what is your labour? So, but the key understanding is is that as your if you've got if you forecast ten thousand dollars next week, and you're going to look at a twenty five percent labour spend for you to hit that percentage profit target, that's great. You got two and a half thousand dollars to spend on labour. But if you're going to hit nine thousand dollars, you no longer have two and a half thousand dollars to spend on labour. And if you actually look at the nature of your variable costs, because your fixed costs, if your rent's 10% based on $10,000 spend revenue, if that revenue goes down, well, then your rents just become 11%. So you've actually got less to spend. You no longer have 25% to spend based on a $9,000. You might only have 23. So the absolute key thing is understand your key distribution of costs and to adapt real time do this really annoying bouncing ball that we call our day-by-day revenue. And that's pretty difficult to do. It is and it isn't. So if you get the framework done, so if you you understand your business viability assessment, that becomes then a standard formula, then it is. You need to have, I'd certainly like to see either a costed roster so that, you know, we understand it's not just about rostering eight people on a Friday night. It's about actually having a dollar spend that we, we write our roster to, we then need to be able to capture day by day in real time what our cost of our labour is. And I've, I've got a venue that I work with at the moment, for example, if we're down by $500, well, an example, I do two weeks worth of trading. So he had one week where he made 9% profit, the next week made the same 9% profit. The difference with the second week and why I was absolutely so ecstatic about the second week they made $2,000 less top-line revenue, but yet hit the same profit percentage. And there was only $100 or so in it for the dollar value. So the ability then to roll back, the ability to adapt to the, the day-by-day and be and defend. You know, you've got to defend that profit target. When you don't get your revenue results, you need to be able to make a change within the business, either to reduce your cost of goods or to reduce your labour. Okay, so... and. You know, I think that this is a really, really interesting conversation. How would you defend your profit target? So you've got a, an overall fixed cost and the, I guess the, the challenge with hospitality, what makes it so dynamic in a restaurant is that there's things zipping around all over the place. So we, our revenue is not consistent with our costs. You know, you might only get that three monthly power bill. You might only, you know, get all these costs that are coming in at, at times all over the place. So we need to take a bit of a bit of an assessment as to what your 12 month result was, having a pretty much good idea to say, well, last year this is what your fixed cost was, this is what your variable cost were, or this is you know probably going to be about where you're going to be this year. You can measure that. I like to measure that on the back of a BAS every three months and just do a good cost assessment. So that gives you an idea of where your baseline is, and then we just need to you need to react. So you need to be able to say, well, okay, there's where my profit and. And it's a, I like to look at a, at four 13 week periods. And if you don't get it one week, so yeah, damn, you know, I've, I've spent six hours too many, too much labor last week on the back of wanting to, you know, make my profit target. Well, then just have a crack at seeing what you can do to reduce your labor the following week. So just, just aggregate it. You can accrue it over week, week to week. And there are particular strategies that you can look at. You know, example would be, rostering by 15 minute increments instead of 30 minutes so instead of them either coming in at 6 or 6 30 you might have some coming at 6 15 so you've got 10 staff that have then just saved yourself 15 minutes these are little it's only six hours you know it's not massive amounts of time that you need to be able to save and it's not going to be perfect but you can't wait until you see your accountant three months down the track and then he goes geez you know that second week in january was a bit ordinary well what can you do about it then <laughs> that's gone 
And that's one of the big issues with accounting is that it is backward looking. And I'm always amazed by the number of people who wait until the end of the year when they go to their accountant to see if they've had a good year or not. And that that scares me massively because you need to be a lot more proactive rather than, you know, annually reactive to your restaurant profitability. I absolutely agree. You know, at the end of the day, accounting is a retrospective management of your accounts, you know, and it's it's an amazing tool and it's an amazing specialization. It's through my, my masters, I've gained a lot of insight in operations by understanding what they do. And some of the key things would be around things like your inventory turnover, how we can apply some really interesting financial theory into our hospitality businesses, which at this stage we don't really consider overly well. But you're exactly right. The, the real-time nature of hospitality is such that you need to make your adjustments in real time. Otherwise, and I've seen it, you know, on bigger restaurants and businesses I've been involved in, you can lose $5,000 in a week because if you're overspending, that's gone. And if you're a 5% net profit business, that's $100,000 worth of earning to be able to recapture that $5,000 that you just blew. So you got to, and obviously the... You know, every dollar that you save straight to your profit. If it take, if you have to earn ten dollars to to earn, you know, get ten dollars revenue to earn that one dollar profit, it's really it's really a lot more efficient to simply not lose that one dollar profit in the first place. Absolutely. Now, one thing that I'm really interested in is that a lot of people think about time in front of house. So a lot of you know, there are some people who think about revenue per available seat hour. Do you think that the concept of time applies the same for back of house? Like, what is the implications of time in the kitchen? I think this is is something that, uh, as an industry, we don't put a huge amount of thought on. And it, it's been around for a while, you know, understanding your, your throughput, really coined the theory of constraints, which is a good 20 years old um, sort of understanding. Because when, when you think about it, your kitchen's a manufacturing facility with a just-in-time inventory. So pretty much going to be making the same things. You know, people are going to, same as if they're going to go and order a car, you know, they're going to make the same things. You know what they're going to largely have. You just have no idea at what stage and what combination of items. So yes. it's, it's a manufacturing process. And a, a menu design is absolutely crucial to facilitate that. So an example, I, I worked in a, in a large place that was very heavy on chicken. You know, we go through per site probably around a ton of chicken a week. Um, including a chicken wing. So chicken wings are going to take nine minutes in a fryer for you to for you to cook them so you don't kill people. Now, we all know that in a busy Friday, Saturday night, you more or less have your two sittings. So you've got your 6.30 diners that come in, 6.30, 7, 7 o'clock diners. They're getting their entrees. But when they're getting their mains, that's when you're kind of getting the next wave of people through and they're back in their entrees. So you want to make sure that you're not clogging up your kitchen. You know, if you've then got entrees that are taking nine minutes in a fryer, how are you getting on for your entrees in your second sitting, your mains are going to get held up. So how to, you know, really understand how we can construct the the menu, how we can, you can use pricing, so pricing as a tool to improve the rate of sales. You know, in basic theory, you're going to, if it's a little bit cheaper, you're going to sell more. So something that, that might have a lower cost of goods, you get a lower profit, but it only takes two minutes versus something that if it takes you 15 minutes to do, well, you, you're only going to do four of those an hour. Oh, and find- we, we all know you've got a peak time. You know, peak time on a Friday, Saturday, you've got like three hours to pretty much make your weekly revenue. I find this really fascinating because when you look at menu engineering, this is often the component that is left, that is dealt with retrospectively when after a month of trying the new menu, people go, we can't make this work because it's taking too long to get stuff out of the kitchen rather than actually thinking how long does this take to prep? How long does it take to actually cook? And how many of those could we do in an hour? As you say, you really need to be thinking about your peak times because that's when you're going to be making most of your revenue. Exactly right. And it's a really good concept. You know, the front of house is out there selling stories about a sell product. When in it, from an output thought perspective, so either on your coffee machine, in your bar, or in your kitchen, you're effectively selling time. So if something takes five minutes to do, you're doing five of those an hour, unless you're going to have to add some more labor to it or some more infrastructure to it that allows you to increase that output. Now, even just tweaking that, so being much more operationally efficient, if that then becomes 
you know, so if you're taking five minutes, it takes you 12, then all of a sudden you take it to three minutes. It's not a big saving. That's, that's a big difference. Then all of a sudden you've got 20 that are coming out without any additional labour. So even though we, we view cost of goods, to me, as a philosophy, it's an indication, but it's not a hard and fast rule. We really need to understand what we get when we have a look at cost of goods. And I kind of describe it to people saying, well, okay, so it's, we're obsessed with the percentage. That's the, the sort of industry. You've got this percentage to hit on your cost of goods. So as a consumer for yourself, James, would you rather spend $50,000 and then sell something for 100 or would you rather spend two and a half thousand dollars and sell something for ten? Because in, as an industry, oh no, you don't want fifty percent cost of goods. We like the twenty five percent cost of goods. But but, but we've made fifty thousand dollars versus seven you know seven dollars fifty. So we can actually have a higher cost of goods figure, but actually have more money in your debt. You can actually win by losing. This is see once again, and I think I think one of the problems is that is that far too few restaurant owners actually understand their P and L in any way, shape, or form. They look at the bottom number and go, "That's good," or far too often they say, "That's bad." Though the next step up is some people who are trying to apply some basic metrics, but not understanding why they're applying those basic metrics. So you might want to sell a steak because you're going to make fifteen dollars on it. You know, when you're selling it for thirty dollars as opposed to people who'll be looking at saying, well, you know, we can sell these for $15 because we're making $7.50 on it. And I think less than 1% of people are saying, well, of those two menu items, how long does each take to prepare? And are we creating a constraint within the kitchen because we're not going to be able to get those out in time? We don't want front of house pushing whatever this menu item is because it clogs up everything else and it, it creates, you know, a lot of tension in the kitchen. Far too few people are thinking about these, these concepts either. Exactly. And we need to, under, I think what I often hear is like, you know, but this is who we are. This is what we do. And there's an awful lot of levers that we have to pull. So no one's saying that you have to stay that exact way. So you can change your menus. You can change what it is that you're doing. Because at the end of the day, you wouldn't believe it. I've heard a number of operations say this to me. So I asked them, okay, so what, where did you get your KPIs from? So what you're, you're telling me you hit your KPIs, where did they originate from? Oh, no, I saw them on the ATA site or I saw them in the ABS. So I say, okay, so you're looking at the average from operations within Australia. So there's an enormous range in what you're going to get. But also that's based on a 2% net profit and a 50% failure rate. So you're pretty much copying what it is that everyone else is doing and then that's the result they're getting. Is that really the place you want to come from? <laughs> is that what you want to be aiming at? And we have a lot of options. We really do. How... You know, a fine dining restaurant is going to be different as an overall. It's still a hospitality business, a restaurant. But it's, you know, generally you're going to have much lower cost than your purchasing because they do all the fancy work to it. You're going to have a much higher fit-out cost on that restaurant. You're going to have a higher average sale price. You're going to have a much uh, lower table turnover. You're going to have a much higher labour percentage because they're having to um, manufacture the food more themselves versus a quick service restaurant which might do the opposite. So they get a higher table turnover. They might have a faster inventory turnover in their bar, lower average check, but they've got a, they've got a slightly higher cost of goods, but they've got a lower labour. So we've got all of these tools to fit in. And the problem, I think, within the industry is we go, right, there's your good old roll out your 30% cost of goods, 30% sort of labour model. But it doesn't mean that it applies to your individual business. And we've got a lot of things that we can do. And, I, and I'm, I'm a big believer that people really are the experts in their own businesses. The key is just giving them the right information and the right data and asking the right questions to allow them to come up with the best answers. Because when you see it, when you see what you're trying to hit, when you can see that dartboard, it's an awful lot easier to hit that number. Exactly, exactly. And I think as people skill up in the way that they look at it and start pulling out metrics that work for them, we're going to start to see a lot more people throwing some decent money to the bottom line, which would be exciting. And it is interesting because you look at that data and, and it's, there's plenty of places that will come out with, you know, these are the averages for this, that and the other thing. I was reading a study on something that was completely unrelated. It was flight suits for US Air Force pilots. And what they'd done is they'd created their sizing based on the averages of all of their pilots. Now, the massive issue with that was that they were taking the average chest size, the average arm length, the average leg length, the average waist size. And the suits that they were making fitted virtually no one because no one had 
was fitting within that distribution. So there were people who had shorter arms and longer legs or a bigger waist. They weren't at the very, very, very few pilots were average across all of the metrics that they were applying. So you look at what you're talking about and, you know, I think the figures are, you know, 40% cost of goods sold, 31% labor, 15% overhead and 11% rent. There's probably very, very few people who are fitting that model and yet everyone's trying to come up with to make that work, which is really setting them up for failure. The other thing I think is that people aren't individually, and as you said earlier, and I love that phrase, you know, it's about the questions that you ask. There aren't people who are saying, what can I do to, to change my cost of goods sold? How can I make a difference there? When you start asking that, that's when you start seeing the innovation and you'll find people who are significantly out of whack, either plus or minus because they've actually made, d- decided to take an action and to do something which is then going to work with the market and provide something that no one else is doing because they're actually doing something significantly different to everyone else. And the customers go, wow, this is different. This is exciting. And I think we've, we really are wedded to perception of an ideal in a restaurant. I think... For me personally, one of the best places that I've ever been to, and just and I, I really, I, I sit down in a restaurant and I just look at it all. So I'll, I'll have a bit of an idea going. Okay, I can pretty much guess what your average check is. I can see the number of staff. I know your your hourly um, cash burn. I've got an idea of how much your rent's going to be. I can pretty much within fifteen twenty minutes get an idea of where you're sitting from a profitable perspective and whether it works or not. Now we there's a lot of things that actually are flexible. Now, as you mentioned, like you, there's nothing actually wrong with having a higher cost of goods. You just need to have a lower labour. So if your model is that we, and you'll see a lot of the what we're wedded to with a lot of the burger setup. So you know you'll have just not even necessarily qualified chefs out the back. They'll just be, you know, a, a, someone that's a, an experienced cook or a chef and a couple of offsiders, one person on the counter, someone out there might be clearing tables. But it's about how rapid they're selling the item. So lower price smashing it out, got a lower rent percentage, cost of goods is high, but the rest of the business is, is coordinated to actually have downward pressure on their costs, which is a, good, is a really key thing. And, and I absolutely, I, I love your story about the, the flight suits. I sort of describe it in saying, well, okay, James, I'm going to buy you a new pair of shoes. Happy days, mate. Here's the average shoe size. Off you go. Go, go wear them, which of course you can't because <laughs> the average by definition doesn't actually fit anybody. <laughs> it's um, it's distributed all over the place, and exactly, we do yeah. have a lot oh, yeah. of we, we do have a lot of options. You know, we can. Uh, I think ideally, you want to look at, you know, if you can set up your infrastructure. So when you're starting the business, because you can capital capitalize those decisions. As and if you have a if you spend money up front that's paid for by your bank loan, that then has downward pressure on your labour every single day. To me, that's a massive win. You're going to win in a lot bigger way on the labour you're going to save week by week than you are on the slight amount more money you're going to pay on, on paying back that equity. I've, I've seen an example would be just off the top of my head would be, um, I don't know if you've seen some of those pour my beer beer taps where the customers themselves go out and pour their beers. You know, they put some money on a card and they go pour their own beers. Well, so you can have a lower price point because they are actually doing it themselves. But you're not having to have the labour either. So you've kind of pushed the labour. You're paying the customer effectively by having a slightly lower sales price. Now that's a strategic decision to make. And going back to you know one of my key favourite restaurants was here on the Sunshine Coast. It was terrible infrastructure. It's your plastic you know tables and chairs that you'd get you know that you'd see you know on an old resort that had been out in the sun too long. They were mixed match plastic cups. They were wet cutlery because they're being turned over so fast. But the food was phenomenal and it was cheap. And you got an hour and a half wait. So people are understanding, well, actually, I, I am happy to give up on that experience because I'm getting an amazing product at an amazing price. We don't have to have everything perfect because as consumers, we're happy to say, I'm, I'm willing to take the hit on the infrastructure and that part of the experience because the other part of the experience is absolutely phenomenal. And I, I think that that's the really important thing. And you see it all of the time. You'll see, you know, and I think... It, it's not great to have crappy food, but at a um, that's good value. It's very interesting though when you see really, really, really good food in a dodgy environment because often the dodgy environment is part of the experience. And so many people talk about the best meal that they've ever had, and it's in this dodgy restaurant 
that, you know, sometimes no one ever knew about, but the chef, you know, came from this country and was a top-notch chef creating, you know, creating meals with the best ingredients that they possibly could get. And creating experience, and sometimes you know some of those restaurants, uh, literally dive restaurants, do have you know significant queues. Not a lot of investment Great. in technology, but you know just amazing food. And these are all strategic choices. You know they've made the, the business decisions that are made, and they can still be very very successful. Absolutely. I think in Australia we. We, we get very overwedded to these massive big menus, which make no sense to me. You know, you, the more that you travel, the more that you see other cultures doing the opposite. You know, you go through Asia, you might go to a town and there'll be one restaurant and that they are the best in the whole area for dumplings. But all you're going to get is dumplings. There's nothing wrong. If you're going to make a reduced offer, just make them absolutely amazing and you'll sell them out the door. And, and you've seen this more and more, like when... Chipotle rolled out in the US before they started poisoning people. It was like six, six menu items based on just doing each item really well, having a really good throughput, understanding how it is that you're, you're creating that environment and speed and production. So we don't have to have enormous menus. I'd, I'd actually suggest the opposite. A lot of the research suggests you want to be looking at around seven entrees and, or six entrees and seven to ten mains. And desserts, again, are a strategic choice. Do If you're a lower table turn environment where you really want to strive for a higher average check and you can have beverage to support that and prop it up a little bit, then let's get into a lovely dessert. If, if it's really all about making money in your entrees and your mains, you just want a quick, fast, cheap and cheery dessert so you can get people on the way and get the next bum on the seat. And not enough people. It's interesting. I've spoken to restaurant owners who work really hard to try and create that full two-hour dining experience when just scratching the mirror surface of how they make money in that business, you can see that they need to turn their tables, you know, two, two and a half times a night. But they haven't thought – and they're actually doing everything that they can to stop that by giving people – you know, one of the big things is offering free Wi-Fi in a place where you want to be turning people over probably not the best idea because people are more likely to sit there for half an hour while they surf the web. No, exactly right. And I've seen, um, I've seen some places through in New York, for example, and a few places through in the UK and London absolutely will refuse to offer Wi-Fi. Yep. And I love that because now you don't have every single person sitting in there. Back, you get that ambience of people talking and people come in, come out. I mean, the whole idea of coffee being an espresso was it was fast. It was an express. You come in, you know, go through Italy, you have stand-up coffee bars you don't even sit down you come in you have it you go i love that and for me the most wonderful environment is that of people you know i always turn the music down as my restaurant's filled up because the sound of people is just compelling it's an absolutely fantastic ambience not people sitting there staring at a screen buying one coffee an hour exactly now one concept that i find really really interesting is yield utilization and now that implies discounting you've got a different take on that though so rather than discounting well do you want to tell us what you know what your thoughts are on on the distribution across the week of your business yeah absolutely so if we there's a few real sort of fundamental things that we want to have a wee bit of a look at within our businesses so and one of them again comes back to that cost of goods scenario so i like to see um, my key area that i want to apply discounts to being my bar because for me, bar is more retail than manufacturing because most bars, most of the time, are simply repackaging a good. You're taking it from a tap, you're taking it from a bottle and putting it into a glass. So the ability to create your throughput and your opportunity for throughput is almost uncapped in a bar. You know, I've, I've run bars where I'll, I need three staff to do $1,000 an hour, but I still only need three staff to do $4,000 an hour. But I'd much rather be doing the $4,000 an hour bit. So when we look at discounting that Friday, Saturday, that's your peak time. So that's your full price time. You definitely want to maximize your add-on sales. And I'll talk about how I sort of can, you know, conceptualize that a little bit, a little bit later. But for me, you want to discount during the week. I've got no problem with discounting with two caveats. One, you obviously don't want to be getting less money from the people that are already going to come that would have already spent the higher price. And two, I've often seen a restaurant going, yeah, cheers, our nights are going fantastic. You know, we discounted it to here. It's going so well, I've needed to hire more staff. You go, well, wait, wait, wait a minute. So you've now increased your costs 
but you've decreased your revenue. So you're just as bad, if not worse, than you were compared to your previous Tuesdays. So we can look at things to, you know, if you want to do on a Tuesday, you just can't increase your variable costs. The, any turnover, I mean, as you'd mentioned around your the the dollars per table, your table is a, a seating is a perishable inventory item. Every hour someone's not sitting there, you're never, never going to get that opportunity to sell it again. So you want to get a yield from it. You don't want to be adding additional variable costs to get it because you're just got going backwards and going nowhere. So the, the big thing I did when I looked at a, a whole group of restaurants that I was responsible for is I did this little linear regression, you know, so some fancy statistical work. So I tried to understand the relationship between my labour spend and my revenue. So I put it into this little statistical tool, which is really cool. And what I found was that my break-even point, so my labour at zero revenue was $1,830 a day per site. What I found then was that for every dollar, so 10 cents more, sorry, let me say that, for every dollar more I took in revenue above that line, it only cost me 10 cents in labour. So if your labour is more or less being capped once you get past that that point, you just want to have people selling more and more things because if you sell 50 items or you sell 20 items, your rent's still the same. You don't have all of the same costs coming out of those extra items. So that's where I really like to say food, you want to try to keep that costed well. If you're going to discount during the week, change your concept so you don't increase your variable costs, things like your labour, and then just try to get that average spend up by improving the throughput through your bar. So you think that discounting on the bar is a lot more effective than discounting your food items? Absolutely, for the reason that your throughput is almost uncapped. So if you pretty much can maintain very hard to, you know, double your throughput on a particular item, you can strategically. I mean, I discounted an item that was um, seven ninety five, but it was only costing me a dollar ten to make. But what it did was by turning it down to six dollars fifty, I nearly doubled my turnover, but it was still only taking me two minutes to make, and it actually took a little bit of time off of the kitchen when they were trying to get the mains out. So. That's a strategic little bit of discounting where I can improve the sales velocity, but it didn't cost me any extra labour. Yep. So my variable cost didn't go up. So you can be quite careful. If you're going to discount your steaks and then all of a sudden you need to you know, get an extra two chefs to handle it and your prep's gone out the window, that doesn't really make a lot of sense because you've just given up more in those costs than you would make in the money, the extra money coming through. But from a bar perspective... You want to, to me, I think it's the big thing, one of the biggest, biggest things that we don't really ever consider, and it's another failing of our, our cost of goods mindset, is we don't think about our inventory turnover when we calculate our cost of goods. It's not even part of the assessment. So if our cost of goods is based on our starting inventory plus what we purchase equals our cost of goods plus our ending inventory, if you've got $20,000 extra inventory and that it's not turning over or it takes a month to turn over, Again, you could actually get a smaller yield, so a, a lower profit margin, but turn over your inventory in your bar twice a month compared to once a month and actually make more money. And that's the goal, right? For most of it, most of us, yeah. probably <laughs> yes, like it should be. <laughs> For far too many people, it's an unattainable goal, I think, in their, in their mindset. Far too many people I speak to just say it's a really, really tough game and, you know, we're doing as, as good as we can and it's like, if I was doing as good as you were doing, I would stop playing this game because it sounds like crazy. <laughs> or, you know, or yeah. if I was committed to playing the game, I'd do something different. And a lot of the time people, I think, they just feel like they can't get out. They're weathered particularly one way. Something I know that's been a very strong feature yourself and, and what drives you in contributing to the industry is it just becomes the owner that takes the hit. So the poor owner, he or she turning out doing 80, 100 hours a week, and it's pretty hard to start being the best you can be and offering the best to your business of yourself when you're absolutely exhausted and just doing that in day in, day out. You know, so I think that if we can look at, you know, set aside our rose colored glasses and actually look at it in a different way and understand that there are things that we can change and think about what we can do to change, that's a whole different world of opportunity. You know, and, and at the moment when I look back and quite hard to sort of understand what the nature of our industry is specifically. It's enormous for a start. The the Bureau of Statistics hasn't really done anything since 2007 and eight, and all the other proxy estimates of the market through your IBIS and these other reports that come out, what they suggest 
is that we've nearly doubled the number of operations over the last five years, but we've only increased the total market by 5%. So we've now got bucket loads more operators out there competing for a really quite a small pie. So it's a tough gig. And people can't get out. People can't sell because there's no one that's going to buy them, you know, and they're not making the money they need to to be able to stay in there. They can't walk away because you lose your house. So really is a matter of sort of stepping back and thinking about things in a, in a bit of a different way. And then, and that there are a lot more options. It's not, don't be a slave to this average mindset of it has to be this particular way, because there's a lot you can do to be success, as successful as you deserve. It's really interesting. I mean, I think the main reason I'm talking to you is that when we talk to restaurant owners, you can see that this is the biggest problem because I think, you know, restaurant owners should be spending some time being better leaders, thinking more strategically, being more innovative. And of course, at some stage, they need to do sit down and do some damn marketing. That would be a good idea. That may just help a little tiny bit. But so many people that we talk to, they go, yeah, I know I need to do that. But what are you going to do? I'm working 70 hours a week. When am I going to fit that in? And these are the kind of things, thinking about these sort of things, if you've got 15 minutes to work in your business and you haven't covered off on some of these points that we've discussed today, they're going to be the easiest and quickest wins that you can actually, you know, make a little bit of, start making a little bit of money because what money buys you time. You can employ someone else to do probably a lot of the work that you're doing because most of these people, there is some work that only a business owner can do either being the leader or mentoring the leaders within the organization, thinking strategically that, you know, and setting down the, the, the vision for the organization. That's really the business owner's kind of job. But what we find so often is that they're waiting tables and, you know, and they're helping out in the kitchen or or I've had business owners deliver food to me on a Friday night. And it's like, you know what? I reckon there might be a better role for you. I've seen it, was, it was actually quite a quite a big moment for me when I sort of started to study. And I think look, this, this is there's an evolution of management, right? Like I think that when you sort of sort of first start out, the very first place we all get to is, oh, just if only I could clone myself. If only I could do everything. If only I could. Everyone could be exactly like me. And that's kind of the first place you get to. And that's not the place. <laughs> that's not where you want to end up as a leader. The very very essence of being a manager, like the goal of leadership is to achieve business outcomes through the activities of other people. Now, when you really take that into your soul and really accept that, there's a very different way in which you go about leading. So for me, if I pay a staff member, I'm not here to do their job for them. I'm there to try to facilitate their success and get as many roadblocks out of it as possible. And there's going to be, there's not a zero-sum game. People are going to make mistakes. These things are going to happen. That's it's just human. And we get really... Are wet, wedded to perfection. You got, you got 300 meals that go out in three hours, and you get three complaints. That's actually really, really good. Yeah. What other industries happy with that sort of dynamic industry and having a one percent failure rate? Be stoked <laughs> and <laughs> through the work, through the moon. You know, so it, it is a matter of I think understanding that what I find, and we've all gone, I've gone through this myself, is that yeah, you know, you can be a bit of a martyr. I am working 70, 80 hours a week but I'm really not getting 70 or 80 hours worth of work done in those 70 or 80 hours because I'm stuffed. I'm really, really tired. So I'm not particularly efficient. There are plenty of time. There's well and truly enough time within a week. Investigate things that will make things better and get a wee bit of a better understanding. Because once you get that, once you get that framework and you get that understanding, it, it's like you can, it's like seeing the dots in the matrix, you know? You start to actually understand that you can make changes and understand the impact of those changes and just keep on changing it until you get the result you want. Absolutely. We've covered a lot of ground today and I think that there's a huge number of nuggets in there for restaurant owners. I think there's also a lot of ground that we haven't covered so it'll be really good to get you on to talk about a couple of other topics that would really, really help people to create that profitability. Because I, And I think you know, it's all about finding those little tiny wins so that you can start working manageable hours and then start running a real business rather than, you know, just being, you know, doing the jobs of two or three other people as well as your own, which is just absolutely madness. And that's why so many people burn out and the businesses fail and people lose their homes. How sad is that? Yeah, I agree. And I think I think if people can get back to a place in which they turn up to work, they, they start their week with the same amount of vigor and enthusiasm they did when they first got involved in the business, 
then that, that would just be a revelation. It's a massive gift to give back to people, to have that, that passion, because that's what we all want as consumers, because we're all consumers as well. You want to be able to enjoy places and help them to be and, and support them, help them to be successful and keep their homes and continually contribute to the broader economy. And it is just wanting that little changes bring big results. Yep, yep. All right, excellent. Thank you very much, Ivan. We'll, um, no doubt we will talk soon. Absolutely any time, James. It's been a real pleasure. No worries. Thanks, mate. Bye. Thanks, mate. Bye-bye. So I don't know how you got on with that. We talked a lot of numbers, a lot of figures. Now, one of the things that we're doing with Marketing for Restaurants is we're including the transcripts in our show notes now. So Christine, one of our awesome team members, she is transcribing all of them. God bless her heart. If you miss some of those numbers, you'll be able to go back and have a read through. And I think that this is one of those podcasts where you may want to go and have a bit of a read. So it won't go up immediately if you're listening to this in the first couple of days. Normally takes her, you know, it's probably three or four days before she gets the transcript up. Oh, her and Jasmine actually put them up, but it'll be Christine who's working through that. Have a read through it and start breaking down some of those things. I'm always amazed at the people who don't look at their kitchen configuration when they're planning their menu. But hey, that's just me. The big takeouts that I got from that conversation were cost out your business and create a budget, okay? I think this dovetails in really well with the stuff that we were talking with Robbie about in last week's episode about how to buy a restaurant. You know, you've got to have the end in mind. Too many people don't have a a budget for what they're planning on doing in a week. Uh, Try rostering in 15-minute increments. You know, what a great idea that is. That could make – they're one of those ways – and I love that idea because it's a practical way that you can make a difference – to your labor costs on a daily basis. Look at costing your menu for time as well as your cost of goods sold and labor. Now, too many people don't do this. A, too many people don't cost their menu. Too many people only cost it for the cost of goods sold. You've got to include your labor component in there as well. And then look if you're creating a bottleneck. And this is the thing, you know, when you look at that menu engineering matrix, If you've got something that's creating a bottleneck, that implies scarcity, put the price up. You know, move some of your demand from a highly, if you're putting the price up, you're going to make a highly profitable item. So move some of that demand into something that you can cook a bit quicker so that you've got the right mix there. And this is why, you know, it's good to have a few items on the menu, not too many, of course. You can turn out quickly some that you're going to make really good money on. And I think that's the essence of the the menu matrix. Look at discounting your bar rather than your food. Now, I had never really thought of this, and I think that this is absolutely amazing. If you used your bar as the loss leader to bring people in, you can get a lot of people in. You're not going to create a bottleneck. Whereas if you're using food, then you are. Hmm, really interesting. And think, have a look at your inventory turnover as well, you know, and it is scary, you know, just to think, yeah, I've seen places where you know, you can tell that they're not turning the stuff over that quickly. So there you go. Once again, hit us up on Facebook, send us an email. Love to hear from all of the restaurants all around the world who are listening to the podcast and who are becoming our customers. Hopefully by the time this one goes live, we'll be in nine countries. We've got our first customer in Dubai going live very shortly. That is super exciting. Uh, Really excited to, as we increase the number of countries that we have got restaurants in that we're helping. And of course, 108 countries or whatever it is now, whatever we're up to, who are listening to Secret Source. And uh, don't forget the five minute a day restaurant marketing MBA. So we have sent out just under a quarter of a million emails and we've got an open rate of around 25%, which is amazing when you're considering these sending out a quarter of a million emails. I know that those emails are going to people all around the world just with a little tip, trick, strategy, tactic, idea, or just a little bit of inspiration to help you find more customers and turn them into repeat customers. So that's it. There's plenty of ideas out there to help you run a more profitable business so that you can work a little bit less time and start focusing on the really important things to help you find more customers and turn them into repeat customers. I hope you have a busy and profitable week. Bye. Want more customers for your restaurant, cafe, or takeout? Every month, our marketing tools and information are used by thousands of restaurant owners just like you to help them find more customers and turn them into repeat customers. All of our tools and information is designed specifically for restaurant owners. We know you don't have a lot of time to spend marketing or learning complicated procedures, so our tools are quick 
and easy to use. If you're looking to increase your revenue and profits or want to work less hours, check out marketingforrestaurants.com.